Gene Jones is the testing, guy. testing, testing. I, yeah, I've just, seen let's see. him in something else recently, too. Hello, Gene check, check. Testing. Okay, nice. Excellent. You wanna you wanna test him? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, good. Good. <laughs> hey, testing one, two, three, one, two, three. Yep. Yeah. All right. Ha-ha. you drive this vehicle this is what you did last time so you're hosting <clears throat> welcome to the joe rogan podcast <laughs> pull that just up. kidding just kidding uh, you guys <laughs> wish you're listening to that but you're not uh this is the perfect movie podcast i'm kaylin i'm michael today we have some special guests uh reoccurring guests i should say good friend john jonathan strom and my good friend andrew schultz McCallahan? Yeah, what's up? It's me, Andrew Schultz. I don't really like Chinese people that much. <laughs> I don't know why I just <laughs> I don't know why I just forgot your last name. Shout out your last name for us there, Andrew. Madsen. Madsen. I knew it was something that sounded like a city in Wisconsin. Yeah. Um <clears throat> Yeah, today we are continuing our Joe and Ethan Cohen June. So today we are doing No Country for Old Men, a classic. Uh Jonathan, what did you think of No Country for Old Men? So I watched it for the first time Friday, and uh, I liked it. thought it was good. All right. Yeah, Coen Brothers from St. Louis Park. It was your first time watching it, right? Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Andrew, what do you think about No Country for Old Men? Uh, I've seen it like a few times, and I really like it. Classic. It is a classic. Michael? Like it a lot. Hey, uh, you know the Coen Brothers? You know what they like doing? Every once in a while, they don't do it a lot. But they'll just have a kick-ass shootout. Now, most Coen Brothers movies we just, we've been reviewing, we just reviewed The Big Lebowski. No kick-ass shootout. Okay. We there reviewed was a sword out. A sword out? Well, there's a there's a standoff. <laughs> <Pause. But there's> a... <laughs> <laughs> we did Fargo. No, no real big shootout. People got shot. But no country for old men in the middle of this kick-ass shootout and also in another film that we've covered on this podcast miller's crossing remember the danny boy shootout Mm. just a just a man with a cigar and a tommy gun with unlimited ammo have you guys seen miller's Crossing? shooting from the hip i have not you should check it out it's uh you guys need to go through coen brothers they have have some good flicks so that's all i have to say you want us to start i would say big lebowski if you want to get like a feel for like their types type of film, it's like more of a comedy or a dark comedy, but it still has like some nihilism kind of going on. It's got some different things. Great cast, great dialogue, yeah. that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Um. So yeah, let's kick it off with the performance test. It was the performance of a lifetime. The performance test is where we talk about our favorite actors, characters, and moments. Does anybody have a place they want to start? Harvey, Javier Bardem. I think uh, let's get it out the way. Cool haircut. Is it, though? <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he's just incredible in this movie. Uh, he, what did you guys think of his performance overall, or his character of Anton Chigurh? Um. I thought it, well, I haven't read the novel, but apparently his character is supposed to be written like somebody who's from, like, Mars or something. Like, yeah. he's not from this planet. And they did a pretty good job with, like, making a haircut that doesn't fit his face quite well. Right. And <laughs> just the way he talks and his mannerisms. Um, I want the scene where he goes and gets the perm. I need that scene. <laughs> <you know? laughs> I feel like he'd be a guy to do his hair himself. You know what I mean? Because he just doesn't care. 
How about you know? an Anton Sugar origin story, and it's just him growing his hair out? <laughs> <laughs> Starring Timothy Shamalet. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we know Javier Bardem recently from Dune Part Two. Lisa Nagaib. Uh, he was probably the best part of that movie, or like at least one of the better characters. Um, he he's an awesome actor. He was also in the James Bond film Skyfall. Skyfall. He was also a great villain. Um, I was like. Looking down a list of like it was like top 100 villains of all time, and Anton Shiger was on there. It was like he was pretty close up there with like the Joker, and I can kind of see that a little bit. Like it, he he just has so much presence on screen, and uh, you really feel like his absence as well. It's like he could just be stalking around a corner. He's almost like Michael Myers in that aspect. Um, just very well written. Uh, I think it should be pointed out that this story is based on a book by the same name by Cormac McCarthy. It's an older novel, uh, 2005, I believe. And uh, I haven't read the book, but Andrew, you read it. Would you say it's pretty read, similar to the so- one? <laughs> no, he just read a book. It was not this. Book. It was not the same book. Oh, so you're you're a liar. <laughs> I, I, you're, you're just misremembering. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Literally, he said he read The Road. Oh, he said, okay, The Road. Yeah. Not No Country. Okay, never mind. Well, Great job, Cameron. You're cut not it, as avid of a it, reader as I it, thought you <laughs> <laughs> um, So I was going to ask you how uh, close to the source material this is, but uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I, what I like what they did with Anton Chigurh is they, there was, they had a lot of scenes, obviously, in the movie from his perspective. Like him, you know, blowing up that car to get, like, medication from the pharmacy. That was a pretty cool scene. But then they also go it from, uh, show it through Llewellyn's perspective. Like, when he finds the, the tracker in the bag of money, mm-hmm. he's like, there's no way he can keep track. And he f- finds out, but it's too late. He's already at the, the door. Yeah. And- this is a movie with a lot of parallels. Well, we, we go from uh, Anton Chigurh going hold still and then popping a dude right in the forehead to Llewellyn hunting a deer going aiming down the sight going hold still hold still and if you notice in the movie there's lots of paralleling especially between Llewellyn and Anton one gets injured and they're cleaning themselves up and then the next one the other guy's injured and he's cleaning himself up and there's basically like three parties there's uh Anton and Llewellyn and then Tommy Lee Jones character the sheriff and they are all like in this choo-choo train through the plot chasing each other but they never like actually advance and catch up to each other they're all in that sequence it's Mm -hmm. Llewellyn's running away with the money Uh, the the story kicks off with Llewellyn comes across uh, like a, a cartel shootout everybody's dead there's a bag of money he finds he runs away with it Anton and other cartel parties are after him and then there's Tommy Lee Jones as the sheriff chasing the both of them yeah. but they never like they never actually collide other than uh they, they don't really share scenes un- until like Llewellyn and Anton are kind of having that shootout in the uh in the town square or like that that small town or whatever mm-hmm. uh, but they never share really any dialogue other than the phone call as well mm-hmm. um they're never in the same room <laughs> together yeah yeah they are across the street from each other at one point but even then there's the, the divide of the street yeah, the, across the hallway in the in the final hotel. Yeah. and yeah. then there's the very end of the shootout where Llewellyn is kind of advancing up on the car. He's Shigur's hiding behind, but so it goes from the street being the divider to now the car. By the time he gets around the car, Sugar is gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, R.I.P. to that guy that was in the truck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he got fucked <laughs> up. I ain't gonna hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else will though. <laughs> That that whole sequence while we're talking about so in the middle of this movie there's this big shootout uh, in a in a town square somewhere small town Texas and I'm confused whether that's all supposed to be Anton or if so either he's got like Mike Myers abilities and can just pop up like wherever he needs to or the cartel is also there because he's in the hotel and then all of a sudden he's sniping from down the street or somebody is sniping them from down the street so I wonder if it's in that scene is that a convergence of the no, it, it's only Anton. It's only Anton yeah. at that time, you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, kind of, it makes it clear that he does not work with others well. No. Like, 
Oh, yeah. Evidence being him going to the busted drug deal and shooting the two yeah. guys that he was with. He does not work well with others. They give him the tracker, and then he's like, thanks. He's like, bang, bang. <laughs> well, he has his own motives. And then it could be that he doesn't have a motive either. He just kind of likes doing this kind of stuff. Um, Woody Harrelson, I guess, has had some... <laughs> Woody Harrelson's character, he's like a bounty hunter. Yeah. I guess he's had like history with Anton. He knows who he is. He's a psychopathic killer and all this other shit. Um, yeah, it, it like John was saying, it just seems like... He's well known, but he's also like a, a loose cannon. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of like the Joker in that aspect, where it's just like an agent of chaos, basically. Huh. Well, I think the movie does try to make it clear Anton does have like a code or principles, but kind of touching on how he's an alien. Yeah, almost. It's clear he has some sort of code, but it's completely inscrutable to everybody except for except Anton. for him. Yeah. Because, I mean, he doesn't kill everyone he comes across. He yeah. leaves, you know, the old woman at the trailer park alone. Why? We're not exactly sure. She was too th- sassy. I know. <laughs> he asked her the same question twice. <laughs> I, I, I think it's because he recognized, like, part of whatever principles he has is, I'm not killing people for no reason. I'm, like, the arbiter of death. Or he can, like, he's, you know, the Grim Reaper almost. But he he doesn't just take anybody out, and I think he recognizes that like this woman has her own principles. She's like, I can't give you this guy's information. He's like, Oh, fair enough. That's part of her job. And she was also kind of saved by whoever was in the bathroom. Because yeah. remember the the toilet flushed or something, or the sink turned on in the yeah. bathroom, yeah. and he oh. kind of looked in there and he was like, Maybe this is not something I want to do right now because it's just like. There's witnesses and all it's, this kind of shit. It's utilitarian, mostly. He kills people that are in his path or could snitch on him or whatever right. or, yeah. or against his uh, goals, but he's not just a loose killer that's just like, you're in my way for yeah. the right. most part. You could also kind of see like frustration with him as the movie goes on because Llewellyn is hard to kill compared mm-hmm. to most of the people he yeah. takes out. And so he makes it personal. And from that aspect, it's like him learning to be human almost because you're saying he's such an an alien like person, but it's like he's making something personal to the point where it's like, okay, I'm going to actually go to your wife's house after you're dead, after you're dead. And and I'm going to and apparently it was like months after Llewellyn died that he showed up there because some time had passed because her mother had passed away as well. So, mm. well, that's I got the cancer, the cancer. <laughs> yeah. She was a great she's, character. She's yeah. the best part of the movie <laughs> is uh, Llewellyn's stepmother or mother-in-law. But, uh, well, he has a code, but I think his code is bullshit. The reason he shows up at the house later on is because of the phone call where he says, you can yep. save your wife and just give me the money. Now I, I won't save you, but I will save your wife. And Llewellyn says, nah, we're going to have our shootout basically. Um, so that's why he shows up at the house. And then when Carla Jean's sitting there with him, she's like, you don't have to do this. Yo. Yeah. You're crazy. Yo. And he laughs. He's like, this is what they always say. But she's calling him on his BS. He tries to do, because he, he stole Two-Face's whole flow occasionally. And the, he just the, does a coin flip. Game yeah. of chance. And, and says, uh, you know, call the, call the coin and you live or die. And he does it with Carla Jean. And she's like, no, I'm not playing your stupid Yo. game. She's just like, no. Yeah. And he kills her anyways. And it kind of rattles him because you can see in the car, he's like really distracted. Yeah. And then he gets T-boned. And I think, yeah, you can see he's kind of like short circuiting or dealing with stuff because throughout the movie, he's like almost not a human. He's just like death incarnate. But once he's like outed as just like a kind of a murderous human being who's governed by the same forces he thinks he's representing... Yeah. yeah, it distracts him, and he gets fucking wrecked. <laughs> and then it's like the, then life is playing the game of chance with him. Yeah, yeah. he's and not like, he's not outside of the game of chance. Yeah. He plays with everybody else. You got no cause to hurt me. No, but I gave my word. You gave your word to your husband. That don't make sense. You gave your word to my husband to kill me? Your husband had the opportunity to save you. Instead, he used you to try to save himself. Not 
like that. Not like you say. You don't have to do this. People always say the same thing. What do they say? They say, you don't have to do this. You don't. Okay. This is the best I can do. Call it. I know she was crazy when I saw you sitting there. I know exactly what was in store for me. Call it. No. I ain't gonna call it. Call it. The coin don't have no say. It's just you. I got here the same way the coin did. That's great writing right there. That's 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 awesome. Other great writing is how that boy just keeps going. Look at that bone. Look at that, that bone sticking <laughs> out of your arm. He's <laughs> like, look at that fucking bone. <laughs> Shit, Mister, I'll give you my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that's what what I think. Uh, that's the extra Coen Brothers flavor. Is all these like little small town like humans just the yeah. like the the guy that runs the cowboy shop and uh, Llewellyn shows up and like yeah. just boots in a gown and yeah. he's like hey fella how the boots going <laughs> like, just absolutely not rattled also a uh, parallel like what you were saying earlier uh Llewellyn when he's walking like on the border or like through the border crossing and he asks that guy for to pay money for that guy's jacket and then the kid giving Anton his mm-hmm. his shirt I don't know if there's like if I'm just kind of reaching with that, but I've seen like a parallel with that. Um, no, Cause Llewellyn yeah. had to pay for it. And yeah. Anton wanted to pay for it. The kid was going to offer him the shirt for free, but he insisted. It so. makes sense to Anton transactional. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To Llew- to Llewellyn, he's a human. He understands empathy and compassion. Yeah. But he doesn't get it in that case. Right. Mm. Um, yeah. We kind of like went on a deep dive of Anton Chigurh. Yeah, yeah. uh, that was pretty awesome. Uh, let's move on to some other characters. This movie opens with Tommy Lee Jones speaking over shots of Texas countryside. And it's basically him going, man, the world's bad. I'm old. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> I love, uh, he has a conversation with another sheriff from another county. And the sheriff is like, there's I, if I if you would have went back fifty years and told me that kids would be walking around with green hair, I wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> I, that too. I thought that was crazy when he said that. I was like, "Was this movie made again?" Yeah. <laughs> They've always been mad about hair color. Oh yeah, yeah for they sure. always. I feel like you even see Tommy Lee Jones kind of being like, "I don't know about that one." <laughs> like, they've been commiserating about being old and not not understanding the world, but that one he was. Like, I don't know. Oh. Murder and green hair don't really go in the same yeah. uh, category. Two but. different boats. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, Tommy Lee Jones is, he's almost, I see him as more of the protagonist than anybody else. Um, just because the story is called No Country for Old Men. And it's kind of like he's going through this crisis in life where he's on the verge of retirement. He's, he doesn't know what he's going to do with himself after he's done. He just left the men in black. He was trying to get <laughs> life, you know. He, he oh just realized gosh, there's yes, aliens right. and he was like, I don't know, man, life is, uh is complicated and uh i mean i just see him as more of like it's the overarching narrative just another connection my brain made josh brolin plays young tommy lee jones in yeah. men in black Damn. what is it three or four? Oh my three, god everything <laughs> is connected it's like star wars I, I almost didn't recognize josh brolin in this movie and i know we're talking about boys yeah. but i so I was like oh kind of looks like uh like a young tom Selleck or um yeah the stash the stash that d- does something i don't know i thought you were gonna say he looks like thanos <laughs> yeah <laughs> he, he, he looks so he small <laughs> like this is before hollywood's like oh you got to be big and beefy no yeah. actors were skinny as hell back then Have you seen the video of like some guy getting absolutely ripped to be in jurassic park 5 and i'm like why do you need to be buff <laughs> was to that, be in um, jurassic park 5 that, was, is that, that wasn't chris pratt was no it? it's some new guy they're rebooting it i oh, think oh god like, action movie they need you to be 20 pounds heavier It'll with be muscle. hunky beefcake yeah we're going to have old guys looking like Master Roshi. Yeah. <laughs> I'm okay with that. 
John likes a beefy boy. Yeah, <laughs> the white beard, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. We all want to look like that one day. But. Yeah, heck yeah, man. Um, also, Josh Brolin in Dune with uh, Javier Bardem. Is, we got more connections wow. going on. Oh, my God. What are the odds? It's like Hollywood, they, they hire the same actors. You know? It's almost <laughs> like they all work with each other. <laughs> um, yeah, Josh Brolin is great. It's a lot more nuanced of a role. He, he's very stoic. He, he talks to his wife like real crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Keep on your math. I'll take you back there and screw you. <laughs> He's, I laughed so. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> He's so like cryptic with her. He can never just tell her anything straight up. He's always got to be like, I got something to do. I think that's like a type of guy he's embodying. Though. Yeah. He's like, I yeah. do not want to talk to my wife. He's a blue collar guy. I mean, this know? is a very like. A small town male centric view of what a relationship yeah. is for yeah. sure. I could just see the incel boys being like, "This is who I want to be like." You know, the incels, hell yeah, tell her to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the incels never took a uh, Anton Chigurh, and you think he'd be? I right think up they there. did though. Did they? You know what's the big one that incels are taking right now? Homelander from the boys. That's like a big topic. Homelander's right now. the he's the protagonist. Apparently, a bunch of like. Uh, conservatives are just now realizing that the boys is making fun of them and so they review bombed uh the boys season four and so it's got like a 30 percent on rotten tomatoes or something like that i'll show them (laughs) amazon's hurting now (laughs) they were like oh (laughs) somebody's gay in this i'm not gonna watch it but it's like the whole series people are getting fucking their heads the third season opens with a man running up another man's urethra (laughs) yeah so (laughs) and the boys and the boys oh i gotta watch this show now what the heck (laughs) why do you think it's called the boys (laughs) 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 Yoink. He's like the Ant Man of the universe. That's Crawls up there. someone's <laughs> and then um, expands. But yeah, Tommy Lee Jones is great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> Getting us back on track. Um, also, Llewellyn's wife. She's she's great. She's got a very small role, but I mean, she she plays Kelly like, McDonald playing Carla Jean. Carla Jean. Yeah, Carla Jean. I googled her name specifically so it wouldn't be like, yeah, Llewellyn's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Llewellyn's bitch. <laughs> She's a named uh, character. My favorite line of hers is, I've seen it all. I work at Walmart. <laughs> I mean, that's facts, though. <laughs> I work at Walmart. <laughs> um, again, like Michael, you were saying, just all the side characters, it's everybody. I, that's another mark of the Coen brothers. They know how to do side characters well and just like random people. There's, really there's, well. Yeah. Yeah. There's the one-off side characters, and the one I want to shout out is Garrett Dillahunt as like the deputy because he's kind of like he's kind of dopey, but he's not a complete idiot. No. But he he gets that like gee Willikers, oh this is a big deal, <laughs> like thing yeah. going on a lot. Oh dang sheriff, we just missed him. <laughs> Ooh, that's frustrating. Ooh. <laughs> the milk sweating right there. <laughs> um, the, some of the the Mexican cartel guys. I know the two guys that Anton shoots after mm. they're like uh, like surveying. And the uh, the shootout or whatever. One of the guys is like, "That's a dead dog right there," or whatever. And Anton's like, "Yes, it is." <laughs> uh, and the one scene I think everybody knows from this movie is the gas station visit. Maybe we've touched on it a little bit, yeah. but that's just an all timer. Like, th- it's funny because this movie starts with Anton. I mean, it starts with Tommy Lee Jones, but then it follows Anton next, and we meet Llew- yeah. uh, Llewellyn third, mm-hmm. and. Uh, just the the sequence of meetings. Anton meets kindly Texas person. Yeah, is something we visit visit like three or four times, and it's great every time. The gas station one is everyone knows. I vote for the jumper cables guy, where he's like, "Do you know where the airport is?" He was like, "Airport well, or airstrip?" Well, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> we might just want to go to Dallas. <laughs> He seemed like such a wholesome and nice guy. I know, too bad for him. (laughs) Can you remove those chicken crates? (laughs) Um, Yeah, the gas station scene, I think it's a master class in tension. Uh, Actually, that scene reminds me a lot of like some of Tarantino stuff, just like the the buildup of tension. And it's like, you don't know what's going to happen. Is he going to murder this guy? Is he going to walk out the building? You know, it's it was just awesome. It's very the Nazis visiting the home at the open of uh, uh, of of Inglorious Bastards. Bastards. Yeah. Yeah. You're just in the room with an animal. What's the most you ever lost on a coin toss? Sir? The most you ever lost on a coin toss? I don't know. I couldn't say. Call it. Call it, yes. For what? Just call it. Well, we need to know 
what we're calling it for here. You need to call it. I can't call it for you. Well, it wouldn't be fair. I didn't put nothing up. Yes, you did. You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know it. You know what date is on this coin? No. 1958. It's been traveling 22 years to get here. And now it's here. And it's either heads or tails. And you have to say, call it. Well, look, I need to know what I stand to win. Everything. How's that? You stand to win everything, call it. All right. Heads, then. Well done. Don't put it in your pocket, sir. Don't put it in your pocket. It's your lucky quarter. Where do you want me to put it? Anywhere not in your pocket. But it'll get mixed in with the others and become just a coin. Which it is. Anybody have any other shout outs as far as uh, uh, performances go? I think we covered our big three. Uh, being a first time watcher of this movie, uh, seeing Woody Harrelson in the movie and him not doing much except getting killed was kind of funny. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really, I still don't know what his job was. Or Yeah. Was so I, I wonder if in the book he's more fleshed out. He Carson is, Wells. I believe. I was reading kind of a synopsis of the book a little bit, but he's a bounty hunter. So he's not a uh. hitman, but he's like in the same circle as like Anton. He's employed mm. by the same people. But he just he goes for a bounty. I don't think he's he's really down to like murdering a bunch of folk. He's not a psychopath like Anton. But um, yeah. And his boss is uh, Stephen Root, who you know from when we did Oh Brother Where Art Thou. Yes. He's the blind DJ that yeah. records the Soggy Bottom Boys. Yep. Yeah. He's a he's a Coen Brothers regular or or a Milton in Office Space. Another fun fact about Woody Harrelson: um, his dad in real life was a hitman. Yes. Yeah, which I thought was an interesting <laughs> parallel. Like, oh, is he playing a bounty hunter right he, now? Oh, it's really he, cool. <laughs> I, I don't know if he worked for who was the big the big uh, mobster in New York around like the seventies. Oh. It was it was it um, John Gotti, uh, I believe. Sounds right. Sure, I think you so. Know um, but I, I want to say he worked for John Gotti or he did some jobs for him. Yeah. It, it, this guy was like big time. It was pretty nuts. Um, also, fun fact: I it's possible that him and. Uh, uh, who's the all right, all right, all right guy? Uh, Matthew, Matthew McConaughey. McConaughey. They they might be biological brothers. That's like a, I a believe rumor. it. Yeah. If you I put them next to each other, they kind of look similar. They're all just it's just Texas. Yeah. yeah. Just, um, they're Texas genes. But <laughs> all, it's, they there is some weird <laughs> thing where they 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 think that they might be related to each other somehow or something like that. Um, all white people look the same. It's true. A lot of it's people are saying true. that. It's true. Cousins. Relations, <laughs> relations with cousins. What are, what are you saying about cousins? You might be my cousin, Michael. It could be. <laughs> How many people in this movie had relations with their cousins? That was the question. The lady at the pool, she seemed open to it. Everyone except Anton. Got, <laughs> got some beers in my room. <laughs> He's like, I know what beers lead to. Beer leads to more beer. Yeah, that's oh, true. I, apparently, kind of on that note, Javier Bardem, when they like gave him the haircut, he was like, great, I'm not going to get laid for a couple months now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what uh, it was? I don't know. He looks like uh, he was like Native American. When I first watched this movie, I thought he was a Native American actor. Careful, Kalen. No, I know, I know, but I. <laughs> I was just thinking Andrew's because Native like the, the character of Anton Chigurh, I thought he was Native American or something. I thought it was like a like kind of a, I don't know, some kind of social commentary. Mm. Or whatever. Well, Javier but, Bardem, he's one of those people. He's like a John Turturro. He can just pretend to be another race right, sometimes. Right, right. Javier Bardem, also a space Arab. <laughs> <laughs> you mean Robert Downey Jr.? He can play, <laughs> he can play all types of races. Play the motherfucker. Play the motherfucker. <laughs> it, it is interesting, though, because Anton Chigurh, I mean, he still has like a, like a Spanish accent mm -hmm. in the yeah, movie. But yeah. like he doesn't seem Mexican. But he's also like got the weird looking haircut, you know. He's just—it's just so strange. Well, that's why you're saying he's—he's yeah. a, he's a Martian. He's you know like I mean? he's like not from that world. Yeah, you know? you're not supposed to be able to peg him as anything. Right? Yeah. No. yeah. His like one moment of humanity is when the guy at the gas station wins the coin flip, and he's like, uh, 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 
don't put it in your pocket. Then it becomes just another coin. <laughs> <laughs> it gets mixed around with everything Why else. Why not? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, it, so in the book, in the synopsis I was reading, they said that uh, Anton Chigurh just looks like anybody. He wasn't very physically imposing, which is kind of something they kind of changed for this, because I think he was a scary looking motherfucker. Like, that's one guy you would probably try to avoid. He, it's, it's just like the oddity of his, of his look is intimidating. It's yeah. not because he is physically imposing, like you said, but just... Like, what, like, what, what are, are you? you? Like, what are you, dude? <laughs> like, um, yeah, so if we don't have anything else, uh, let's move on. All right. We're going to do It's an Art Bro, where we talk about the aspects of the filmmaking process, like shots, sets, sets, lighting, costumes. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, a computer-generated image or not, but uh, when... Llewellyn stupidly returns to the scene of the crime and then gets chased by the cartel the way all, all these like night chases yeah. are shot every time the Coen brothers do a night chase it looks awesome but as the camera like turns around and we get this like shaky view of of Josh Brolin running there's yeah. just a massive bolt of lightning in the upper right hand corner yeah and I'm like did they just catch that are they that lucky or did they add that or in? was I've, that imposed I, I have no idea lucky. Oh, like actual lightning? Yes, yeah. there's oh. like a storm rumbling in the distance. I could imagine they did they, get lucky in that. Yes, yeah. I think I think they. Well, I don't think that was intentional, but like in the following scene when he comes home or gets back to his truck, there's a storm like mm-hmm. brewing in okay. the distance. So, I was just impressed and like it, that's so it was a striking image. Speaking of that scene, I love the silhouetted shot of his truck up on the uh, on the hillside, and yeah. then it cuts back to him, and then it cuts back to another truck with the guys popping his tires and i just found that really chilling like it put it yourself in that guy's like shoes mm-hmm. and just be like thinking you're all alone out here and then there's like another fucking truck and these dudes are obviously gonna murder you and then they hit the floodlights on them and stuff um yeah and then the a dog got murdered so well, that was kind of sad yeah that's true it was really yeah. cool the way he got murdered. I though. liked how the dog was just like, you know, it was doggy paddling in the water. He was trying, <laughs> was, he was he trying was really so hard, hard to get him. It was that. really less scary once he starts doggy paddling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A for effort. Though, Another yeah. thing that I noticed about uh, when he's about to go back in the desert, he fills like that gallon full of water. And I'm like, oh, he's obviously going to go out to the desert because he's going to be thirsty. No, he was filling that water jug for the agua for guy. For the guy, yeah. I know, it took me a while to, oh, oh that's right, because the guy was asking for water. I ain't got no agua. And then, and then he was... no lobos out here. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Yeah, and that was his downfall, his uh, his empathy. Yeah. yeah. What an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> Caring about people? How dare you? What the heck, man? What a dumbass. <laughs> A lot of this movie is just dudes in hotel rooms tending to their wounds. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a good portion I of like it. it. <laughs> it's very like Die Hard action movie where it's like you actually, the original Die Hard, like yeah. this man is. Anton you know. was like, he he knew what he was doing though. And I think that speaks to his competence into like his field of work. You know what I'm saying? Like he's just so competent. Like he knows exactly what to do in each situation. Like even like setting up the car bomb and stuff. Like he just knows these things. And that's how you like. I don't know. It's kind of you just get into the mind of this character, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I like those little details. And stuff. Yeah, it's great. When he's in the bathtub cleaning his like thigh. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. And he's like injecting himself with like. It was like uh, affecting me while I was watching. I was like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's really smart the the little hotel swap that happens. I think a couple times in this movie. So Josh Brolin has a hotel. He's hiding the money in the back vent. And then when he returns to the hotel, he sees a cartel truck parked nearby. So he stays at another hotel, comes back, books the hotel on the opposite side of the hotel. So they're like back to back. And then he's in there trying to retrieve his money through the other side while the cartel guys are just hanging out, waiting to ambush him at his original hotel room. And then you think Anton's creeping up on... Uh, Llewellyn, but he's not. He kicks the door open, and there's like four four cartel guys hanging out in the hotel room. Dude, the shot where he shoots the guy in the arm and it just like dangles off him. Oh my god, that shit yeah. was uh, it was gnarly. The like, shower curtain kills. My favorite one of the movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. I thought he was gonna leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the shower head on. <laughs> it's okay. Got you wet. <laughs> you look a little dirty. <laughs> Take a shower. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How much have you ever lost in a coin toss? <laughs> Dang. <laughs> he flips head and then he missed just, uh, opportunity yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, where, where, where were we at? Uh, one other thing to mention. <laughs> <laughs> where are we? <laughs> one other thing to mention, because when, uh, when we watched like, Big Lebowski, you mentioned how great the Coen Brothers music is. There's no music no in No music. This. Yes. Yeah. Like, at all. Not so, at all. So, so the sound is really keyed up on, like, there's dead bodies. You hear the flies buzzing around. You're hearing, like, uh, in the scene where uh, Woody Harrelson gets offed, the phone call is louder than the gunshot that kills Woody Harrelson. Like the phone call is the jump scare, not the not the gunshot. Well, that's because he had a silent shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it literally sounds like if you ever thrown the silencer on your spas in Call of Duty. It's, it's true. Yeah. That's exactly. What Actually, it what like. does that sound like? It sounds Just like a little the Spartan squeaky. laser. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Give, me, give me an idea. Squeak. Okay. <laughs> actually they put that they give you that switch. silencer there's so gta 5 we, we were talking about this in big lebowski how, where are we going hold on no we were talking about this in big lebowski how they gta 5 loves to do their movie references okay yeah. they actually reference no country for old men a couple times in gta there's actually so you know how those random events you can kind of just pull up on um in the there's like a desert area in gta and you pull up and there's the 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 cartel shootout and it's mm. just like the re- remnants of that you see like the dogs and stuff and then you can actually get the silencer from Anton Chigurh's gun on your shotgun and it makes the same noise it's pretty sweet hell yeah it rocks yeah. I'm shocked it's not a Call of Duty skin where you could be like Homelander on Call of Duty. <laughs> yeah. You can't drop in his anti. Anton yeah. Sugar. <laughs> it's on Fortnite, though. <laughs> the hair is hard to render. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just a helmet. Yeah, it's just, yeah literally. It doesn't move. It's just static what, on his what, head. What would be his like, one-liners when, when he murders you? Just be like, how much have you lost on a coin toss? Yeah. Hold still, please. <laughs> 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 can i have your shirt <laughs> um yeah uh the we, we talked a little bit about the lighting and the uh just overall look i love the wide shots in this just a lot of landscape it, it's you're in dirty like not middle america but you're you're getting closer to the deep south i yeah, would you're say in, you're, you're, you're in butthole texas yeah i mean you're you're in a nasty part of town uh everybody's kind of dusty Everything's kind of old, and that's you're talking about how you didn't realize this was set in like the eight seventies or eighties. I didn't realize that either. I kind of just figured this is an old town in America. They yep. haven't really. It's kind of like not, uh, Napoleon Dynamite in that way, where it's kind of like you can't really put a uh, a name for the era. It's just kind of like this, and it, just because it hasn't really evolved at all. But. Yeah, nineteen eighty, I think, is <clears throat> the year that it takes place in, right? Yeah, actually, they, they talk about his. Vietnam service. Yeah. He also mentions years ago. the coin where he's like, "This coin w- uh, was made in ni- 1958. It's traveled 22 years to get here, or whatever." Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that was what I was thinking of. Actually. Yeah, really sorry. Figure out the time. Yeah. yeah. And I did the math. Yeah, I got my calculator. This movie out. made me do math. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> Four out of five stars. <laughs> um, I like the gas station clerk guy. Yeah, he was very, very real looking person. Yeah, you know. Somebody I would see when I, you know. We already talked about this guy. <laughs> I just love him so much. What time do you close? <laughs> at, at, at night. At night. <laughs> well, we close now. <laughs> close right now. now. Now's night. not a time. <laughs> <laughs> so aggressive to this guy. Like, like, just trying to Have you ever stuff. met somebody like that who is like so confrontational, but it's like you're, you're being a sociopath at the same time? You know um, what I mean? Like somebody who just keeps pushing you, you know, or just like makes things awkward on purpose when he was being hyper literal like that i was like oh anton is just an autistic man whose yeah. hyper fixation is on murder <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean that makes yeah it's a pretty good fixation to have murder if you're a hitman isn't, <laughs> isn't that literally the story of the accountant the bat yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, i'm so good at murder because i'm autistic i thought you meant the, i thought you were gonna say the good doctor yeah. I'm a doctor. <laughs> I am a surgeon. <laughs> uh, remember when uh, movies were just like, hey, be autistic. You'll get an Oscar. See also radio. I am Sam. Uh, I am Sam. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, Gump that's the worst the one. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> uh, what was it? Radio? You ever seen radio with Cuba Gooding? Yeah. yeah was I one. am Sam the one that had Gianni Urbisi in it? 
Mm-hmm. Or he's just like. No, 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 no. What's that? What's his no. name? Sean. Uh, Sean Penn. Sean Penn. Okay. Yeah. Not. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's bad. There's also like a, also the the wife from Scarface was in that movie. Mm-hmm. And she was like getting real creepy with Sam. Like she was like kind of falling in love with him and she was like kind of getting a little little R wordy. It was kinda of weird. I don't know. Mm. Which, which R word are we speaking of? Yeah. Uh, in this context, <laughs> hard to tell. <laughs> she was like starting to become a rapper. Oh, okay. She had mm. some some sick beats. Michelle Pfeiffer was trying to become Sugar, a rapper. Sugar Hill yeah, gang. She was. <laughs> Michelle Fife. Yeah. P Pfeiffer. M C Fife. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's move on to hey, what are you trying to say? <laughs> Take it away whenever you're ready. All right, let me just get that last measurement on your Thank you. you know, I, I'm, I need this for the uh, the wedding. Okay, well, I, I, should... I need it really quickly. If I can. Uh, it a could week. take about a week to do. It could take a week. Mm-hmm. So, what are you trying to say? <laughs> it's trying to say that I'm so big, my bum is so big, you need to order to various countries far away to get enough material to make a pair of pants so I can fit my incredibly obese buttocks into a pair of your specially made little suit. No, I mean I'm the only one working here this week. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, hey. oh, that would be great. Mm-hmm. This is where we talk yeah, about the here. themes and ideas. The theme is that this is no country for old men that uh, they don't like <laughs> they don't like green hair. <laughs> Say like metal in her nose, <laughs> yeah, or something. And green hair and metal in their nose, and yeah. tattoos. There's a part this is, when yeah. Llewellyn comes back to the trailer at when he's like telling his wife we got to pack up that I think kind of sums up one of the themes. And it's just he's like, Carla's like, why do we have to go? And he's like, well, things happen, and that kind of seems <laughs> like that, that, that seems, seems like, like one of the themes. Is like, oh well, that's shit a theme happens. for most Coen Brothers movies in general. It's just shit happens. Kind of and uh, so last last episode was Fargo and at the end of Fargo, uh, Marge the Marge Gunderson, so a bunch of people get murdered and she has like the one guy that's left responsible for most of the murders in the back seat. She's a cop and she just goes, "This person died. This person died. This person died. This person died." And why? For a little money? I just don't get it. <laughs> like half Coen Brothers movies <laughs> where it's just like what they're pretty nihilistic and they're also just like. You know, Lou Allen died because he he got greedy. He thought he could get away with this. He's not a irredeemable piece of shit because of it. But he, you know, stepped outside of. He could have just gone back to his trailer, not bagged a deer. You know, took his L, came home. But he didn't. But you also gotta kind of gotta put yourself in his shoes a little bit. If you came across a briefcase with like three million dollars in it, I'm taking that shit. I'm sorry. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But I'm gonna check for a, a receiver a first. Transponder, yeah. Your transponder yeah. or whatever that shit is. I'm gonna check for that. Uh and then I'll be good. You know what I mean? If he would have just looked in the bag a little bit, he he would have been alright. You know? Also that billfold that had or that that band of bills was all ones in the middle. Is it even Damn. the amount of money that they said? No. Damn. Yeah. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. And I also don't understand why he didn't just smash the transponder as soon as he grabbed it. What did he do with it? Did he, he throw it out the window? Or, or, yeah, like, do something. Didn't he it. already hear Anton he got walking dis- up the thing? He got distracted. Yeah. I think he heard some stuff going on, and then he got, got distracted. But yeah. it would have been the first thing I did. I also think the, uh, with Tom, the, the kind of monologue with Tommy Lee Jones at the end, it was such a great scene where he's talking about the, the dream he had of his father. I think that kind of sums up the movie kind of nicely, too, where it's just like, a, he's kind of, go, like I was saying, he was going through a crisis. Like, he, he doesn't know what to do with himself. He, he's confused by the world. He's used to things having rules, and which is kind of like, I don't know, if you're a a southern cowboy type of guy you should be it's like you know that's lawless kind of shit i don't know you kind of come from that lineage of lawlessness so i don't know why you're so surprised by that the world is awful (laughs) you know what i mean but i don't know he's just kind of like he's confused by things he doesn't know like his place and uh he he's like realizing he's just gonna join his father one day you know what i mean in the afterlife and like that's just that's how it's gonna be all right then to um both had my father in them. It's peculiar. I'm older now than he ever was by 20 years. So, in a sense, he's the younger man. Anyway, the first one I don't remember too well, but 
It was about meeting him in town somewhere. He can give me some money. I think I lost it. The second one, it was like we was both back in the older times. And I was a horseback going through the mountains of the night, going through this pass in the mountains. It was cold and there was snow on the ground. He rode past me and kept on going, never said nothing going by, just rode on past. And he had his blanket wrapped around him and his head down. When he rode past, I seen he was carrying fire and a horn the way people used to do. And I, I could see the horn from the light inside of it, about the color of the moon. And in the dream, I knew that he was going on ahead. And he's fixing to make a fire somewhere out there and all that dark and all that cold. And I knew that whenever I got there, he'd be there. Then I woke up. He's, he's a lawman who is becoming increasingly aware of how little ability he, ha he has to, like, maintain any order in, like, a yeah. world that is, like, inherently chaotic. And he's also realizing that as he's getting closer to dying, which is, like, that'd be t that's just tough. Yeah. Um, and so he's trying to deal, I think, with the fact that, like, the world around me is getting worse. I can't change it and I'm going to die soon. So I'm not going to go out on my terms with like a world that is in order, like a lawman would want to see. Yeah. And when he's talking to, I think it's his brother. Yeah. Yeah. With all the cats. So. Yeah. There was one thing the brother said that kind of stuck out to me. He's like, he's talking about death, I think. And he goes, it all ain't waiting on you. That's vanity. Yeah. He's like, I don't know what to do. The world's, falling apart it feels like i'm gonna die and his brother's like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> shit happens yeah and i think it's like the the concept of aging is kind of scary mm -hmm. in itself i think this movie and the irishman kind of the irishman really touches on that especially at the, the ending scene where it's like uh uh the irishman he did all this stuff just to end up alone and yeah. he's scared to shut the door at night and he's you know he he's doomed to die just like everybody you know yeah i don't think this movie is saying the world actually gets worse over time but the universal truth of you get older and you lose touch with it like feels like it, it does. feels like it does yeah you, you have you know and you're just reaching the end of your road and that's that's where everyone almost always ends up there's you know, few exceptions it's funny because i feel that now as well like i'm starting to feel some of that stuff especially with like music yeah, and it's funny because I always found saw myself as a person who was like I'm, I'm open to all types of music. You know what I mean? But it's like some of the stuff that I hear my nephew listening to, I'm like, what the hell is this bullshit? <laughs> you know? <What>? Yeah. <laughs> it's like this guy wearing green hair and all. You know? But it, it's that Pull kind your of pants <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, you used to be able to snatch their tapes and smash them, so yeah. you can't listen to them again. You can't do that anymore. <laughs> no, you have to smash their phone. Their phones. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. And then when they get the implants, you have to smash their, their heads in. Yeah. I, <laughs> it, it's inter Jesus it, Christ. It's interesting that uh, Tom Boyce is his name, um, because I didn't know that was his brother at the end with the cats. But like you said, I kind of figured the older I got, I had eventually found God or something. He that just never happened to him, you know. Yeah, life just kept going, and yeah, you know, I'm I'm just kind of echoing on that, you know. He's being increasingly alienated the older he's getting. Yeah, yeah. My favorite uh, line from that scene when he was like making coffee, and he just looks in the pot. He's like, "How long has this been in here?" <laughs> or whatever. He's like, "How long has this pot been going for?" <laughs> Make a fresh one every week. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking gross. <laughs> <laughs> the dude's house was grody as shit. <laughs> no. It's a very realistic set dressing of somebody who's just like lost all desire to like keep up. He's and also, also, also he's disabled. He's disabled. <laughs> he's disabled. <laughs> just I been mean, sitting in the corner. Having a wheelchair time. doesn't prevent you from like throwing your trash away that's sitting on tables. It makes it a little tougher, but like he could put in the effort. Suppose, but also yeah. he's all he's like overrun with cats and he's like, How many cats do you own? He's like, Oh, they come and go. Some of them yeah. are like mine and some of them are plain outlaws was it like kind of was it uh made clear like was he all was that guy also a cop 
at one point, and was he like shot in they, his legs? Yeah, or they say something like, about he was shot in his leg. Okay, what do okay. you? He asked him like, "How do you feel about the man that was shot in his leg?" And he was like, "I don't yeah. even like consider it much anymore. It's past and gone." Mm-hmm. And then we have also like uh, again with Anton Chigurh, it's just we kind of touched on this briefly, um, just like the idea of chance and how the the universe has its own set of laws and. Uh, there, but there also couldn't be, might not be any laws to it as well. It could just be random chaos. And that's evident with the car crash at the end where it kind of comes full circle with like that whole idea of just, you know, again, shit happens. And, uh, it was Anton's turn to flip the coin, you know? Yep. Yep. And, uh, yeah. One thing about the car crash that I noticed is it's, uh, Usually when they shoot the scene where, like, you're driving through an intersection and somebody gets T-boned, you're looking through the window where the car is coming. But mm. you're not. You're watching Anton through the window where there's nothing coming down on that side of the street. And it, this the, the side swipe comes from the camera side. Yeah. And yeah. that's just a bold decision to, like, real, really side swipe you, the audience, yeah. as well. But I think part of it is to try to illustrate the fact that he is not aware of what's happening. Yeah. He is rattled from the fact that Carla Jean just called him on his shit. He didn't really need to kill her, and he did anyway out of, like, personal grievance, which has not been how he's handled himself the entire movie. And so he's like, I am thinking about that. Yeah. Shit happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look at that bone. (laughs) Look at that (laughs) fucking bone. (laughs) That would have been me. (laughs) There's a bone sticking out of your bone. (laughs) Yeah, no shit. Did you have given him your shirt? He asked for it. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. It's you. Well, geez, mister. You can have my shirt. Yeah. You want anything else? That's Andrew saying that too. <laughs> oh, God. All right. Should we move on? Let's do it. Let's let the hate flow through you. This is where we air out our annoyances and our complaints. Good. Use your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the hate flow through you. <laughs> Do you think this movie kind of deflates? Does it lose steam towards the end? It's purposeful, I think, in the way it kind of just winds down. Like we, Llewellyn, one big complaint I'm sure a lot of people had, or even maybe, I don't know, John, if you thought about this being the first time you watched it, that Llewellyn dies off screen. We, we catch him floating in the pool face down as Tommy Lee Jones shows up like a minute after it happened. Some people would have a problem with that. I mean, movie logic usually dictates there's a big shootout. We see the big shootout. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we don't get that here. But only in this instance. Every other instance in this movie, you get to see what happens. Um, yeah. I assume this was intentional. Uh, for what reason, I'm not quite sure. I think to illustrate your point that it's a chase and Tommy Lee Jones just never quite catches up. Yeah. I think that's it. And just that he's, you know, everybody's a step behind. And again... Like, the chaos of life. Like, you don't always see the most important moment. You can just sure. react to the aftermath. Yeah. You know, you're not always there for that moment. I think some of, like, I mean, after that, it's kind of just meandering a little bit. Because <clears throat> you get more scenes with Tommy Lee Jones, and he goes back to the crime scene. But, see, that I think that scene really, I mean, it works really well because they point out when... Um, he's talking to the other sheriff from the other county that shows up this scene as well. He's like, this guy, we don't know who he is, but he's like some type of ghost. And he just, you know, he's killing all these people and it's really random. And then he's like, this guy goes back to the scene of the crime. And like, he just points out that this is something that Anton does. And so Tommy Lee Jones is like, okay, well, he has the idea to go back to the crime scene. Maybe that Anton is, is there and he can catch him in the act of doing whatever. Um, and then I just love that scene where it's like he notices the uh, the bolt on the door or the uh, the lock is pushed in, um, just has been there or he's already there. And so you can see the fear and the uncertainty on Tommy Lee Jones's face where he's like, I don't know if I want to open this door. You know what I mean? I think I that's really the moment that. he retired. Yeah. Like right about then yeah. is when he was like, I'm too old for this now. He was about to go out there and meet something he didn't understand. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I almost would have preferred like if he would have just left and he wouldn't have gone in because they showing that fear of like, you know, I'm not ready to deal with this. You know what I mean? But he does go in because he is like, he's a lawman and that's his job that's and his this job. is what he does. You know, he's he, he's got to push through it a little bit. You know, I don't know. That's always confused me. Well, just that scene, because is Anton in that room? I think it's alluded to that he went out the window in the bathroom. 
Because if you see the window, oh, the coin he shows, yeah, yeah. He shows that the lock it's unlocked, and, that and it's unlocked with a penny, which he does earlier yeah. in the movie. Yeah, I just assumed it was just a doubling up on the hotel room trick, and Anton was in the adjoining room That's on what the I other side too. of the hotel, and but they, they thought they were going to meet, but they never did. They purposely cut to a shot of the window with the with it unlatched, and I figured that he was in the hiding in the bathroom, and he just kind of. I thought the window was the latched. Window. And it it's... was unlatched, I believe. Um, I'd have to look at the scene again, but I'm pretty sure it was alluding to that. Yeah. He, he there, I, the don't you see him hiding in the room? Yeah, somewhere? They, okay. but I think it's the adjacent room or the one behind it that he gets through from the vent because he's got the pen. He opens it up with the. He pen does. It, they, you know, he's there because they show us before that he's uh, yeah un- unscrewing vents with dimes in his yeah. pocket. Yeah, and it shows the vent on the floor. So he's been there. I just don't know. Also, I know the money isn't like, it's more of the catalyst for the story, but it's not like what happened to the money at the end? Did, did, did Anton did take throw it? it across a bridge? Well, I, but I think he went, Llewellyn went back and got it. And then he went to the, cause he had it when he was in the, the motel at the end. I think Car- Anton has the money by okay. the end. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's not the most important part of the, the wouldn't movie. Wouldn't it have been the cartel guys that kill Llewellyn that take it? The point. Oh yeah. Maybe you're right. Yeah. Cause it doesn't really matter what. No, happens it doesn't matter what happened to the money. But I just thought, like, well, it's interesting because you just don't, you don't really see what happens with it. But I guess I yeah, think that's intentional guys, sure. to be like, this doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Woody Harrelson finds that money really easily. No, he does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He tells him where to look, but he also like doesn't have to look hard at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he just kind of walks up, turns. Oh, also, <laughs> like Llewellyn that's how could have been me. way smarter. You don't stop stopping at places. Go go just get out of there you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. like he if that was me i would be gone you know what i'm saying i would, I would be in mexico or wherever <laughs> yeah, he was in texas the whole time like, yeah he never left the he state. never left and he he kept like doing the switch offs with uh, his wife or whatever like taking her places and then sends her to her mom's house i don't know i just felt like it would have been better if they just both went to their moms and then they went wherever else after i don't know i don't know just a little little gripe he would have gotten found either way yeah, but it's like, I don't know. Also, look through the money, man. Uh, there might be a tracker It's easy there. for you to say. Three-time viewer of this movie or whatever. You know? <laughs> First time viewing, I wouldn't have thought there was a tracker. No. <laughs> um, yeah. Any other kind of gripes? I don't know. It's a really good movie. Yeah, it's There's a not a lot of nitpick about. Yeah. How many I, times have you seen it, Andrew? It's like my third time. Third time? Yeah. I, I think I was telling Michael, I think this is safe to say for me personally, this is probably in my top five yeah, all same, time. Same. It, it's it, the writing is so brilliant mm-hmm. and it's just like, it's so smart and it's, it, it, it is slow. Like we were saying where it's like you, the ending can kind of meander a, l- a little bit, but I just think it works so well for the story and just like these characters and, uh, yeah, just the idea of like, you know, stuff happens. And this is, it's a very realistic view of life, I would say. So, yeah. yeah. So, should we ask our final question? Is this a perfect movie? You lost a baby brother. Perfect in every way. I had a baby brother. I had a little baby brother. And he was perfect. Perfect in every way. Go on our perfect movie list, which if you, I don't know, haven't listened to this podcast often, we're acquiring a list of perfect movies that we will show to the aliens if they ever invade to, you know, show that humanity has built some things that are worthwhile. So you got to make sure to like write this list down, keep it in your pocket. So when mm -hmm. they're about to probe your butthole, exactly. Take out this list and be like, wait, I have something to offer. Don't put it in your pocket. (laughs) (laughs) What pocket? You guys have Wi-Fi? (laughs) Actually, like, put it in your butthole so when they're probing you, they pull it out and then they find it. Smart. There you go. Perfect movie, damn near close, I'd say. I think it. I think it should go on the list. I think this is a. It's a classic. Um, Put it on the list, John. I know this is your first viewing. I don't know if this movie kind of like. We always talk about films that give you this feeling. The tingle. The tingle. And the, uh, like, damn, this is just brilliant. This is great. Um, it can come in all different types of forms. Come as, like, a comedy. Like, for me, it would be, like, 40-Year-Old Virgin. 
<laughs> it gives me that tingle. I don't know. I love that movie. You know what I mean? I'm, for you, it could be 2003 Hulk. You know what I mean? Yeah, it gives you dude. that tingle. It definitely gives me a similar tingle to 2003 <laughs> Hulk. <laughs> uh, I don't see movies like the like this one uh, as much. And uh, it's it, it's refreshing to watch something like this. Great. Um, Coen Brothers, ugh, they rarely miss. So Yeah. That is very true. They yeah. they do rarely miss. Um, did I ever tell you my forty year old virgin story? No, you did not. Okay, so I, I was at. Walk I think Michael, you were there with me. We were at a bar. You know in, <laughs> we were at a bar in Uptown, and we were sitting at the bar top, and uh, the TV was on, and the forty year old virgin was playing. And there's a guy sitting next to me. I was like, "Hey, look, forty year old virgin." And the guy turns to me, and he's like, "Come on, man." You don't got to say that. I'm like, no, dude, 40 year old virgin. It's a good movie. And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, you should have seen the pain in this guy's face, though. And he, oh, he did look like he was in his 40s. Yeah. You know, he looked a little bit older. He was kind of just sitting there at the bar, you know, by himself. Yeah. And I, I think I really hurt his feelings. I felt really bad after that. But uh, I just pointed out, man, it's, it's a good movie. Yeah. He was he telling on himself. You were talking about him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, right. I swear to God, I was. I swear. Uh, yeah. Did he look just like Steve Carell? He did. I really? Remember. No, I'm just, <laughs> He looked like a guy. Yeah. Anton Shiger. Did he look like a Coen <laughs> Brothers extra? He did kind of like have like, he had know. the blonde <laughs> hair. I remember he had blonde hair. He had like a blonde beard. You know, mm. he just looked like a blood mm. beard is crazy. He looked like yeah. a guy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we put it on the list. No Country for Old Men. If you haven't seen it, I think we would all recommend. Yeah. It's also been out for like over a decade. So 2007, <clears throat> I think. Yeah. And it oh. looks really good for a 2007 movie. Yeah. Um, like really good. Big time for Texas because There Will Be Blood was also filming at the same time. Oh, wow. And one fun fact is they had to shut down shooting for No Country because uh, the oil rig fire was being shot for uh, oh, There Will Be Blood. That's awesome. And there was just big black plumes of smoke yeah. where they were shooting and they couldn't you know, shoot that day for continuity. It's also a really great movie. It was yeah. a big time for Texas. They did uh, Hell or High Water. Bush was still president. <laughs> Heck yeah. Bush was still president. Trump was on the way. Yeah. Trump's not from Texas. No, but he he's big in Texas. He wouldn't be on the way Texas. for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, don't worry, Obama's just a little sidestep. We got Trump on the way. They there's, they say that Texas will soon, if not be like the center of like film in the country. Like within like the next twenty years, it's like the replacing Hollywood. Replacing Hollywood, interesting. Cause, yeah, because there's been like a mass exodus of like Hollywood. Yeah. people going down there. I mean, rightfully so, I would say Hollywood yeah. is a disgusting yeah. cesspit. Beautiful weather, too much human crap. Yeah, too mm-hmm. much uh, on, uh, on the sidewalk. Too much. Uh, what is it? The uh, the Harvey Weinstein's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they can still do that in Texas. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like they got better morals in Texas. Yeah. More law-abiding citizens. Uh, Joe Rogan moved from L.A. to well, Texas. Joe Rogan is, he's much like Anton Chigurh, where he is an anomaly. He grows a lot of hair on the top of his head? No. <laughs> well, not that, but it's more so he just doesn't seem like he's from this planet. He just, Jamie, yeah. will you pull that up? Pull up that thing on chimps, Jamie. <laughs> Jamie, he what is the best it. steroid? <laughs> Jamie, what's the most you ever lost on a coin? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen that video of, uh, of Joe Rogan and uh, what is the, uh, the the what is that guy? The, uh, no, there he was doing smelling salts with the uh, the guy who's got like the New York accent. I forget what his name is. Uh, Andrew Schultz. Christopher Walken. <laughs> No. Name New Yorkers. No, he's like a big chubby guy. Uh, Donald Trump. Oh, uh, Action Bronson. Hold on, he was just uh, on that. Big uh, chubby guy uh, with a with a New York, New York accent. accent. <laughs> Ralphie May? Oh, wait, no, he's not from. Hold on, Joey Diaz. Oh, Joey, oh, Ka- Joey, Joey Diaz. Kaka Diaz. Yeah. Joey Kaka Diaz. Yeah. Five hundred milligrams. He does smelling salts with him, and it was pretty funny. <laughs> that guy sweats so much. <laughs> <laughs> he's got great stories, though. He's got a story for everything. I like my favorite one is that he ate like a edible that had like five hundred milligrams of THC in it, and he couldn't like make a right hand turn in his car. <laughs> 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 you gotta constantly make left turns until you find until you get somewhere. His brain just would not let him. Just remember, three lefts make a right. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> All right. Well, 
I think John and Andrew. Uh, was it a successful podcast? Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I think so. Pretty yeah, good. So solid. I wanted to say hi to Germany before we uh, oh. uh, wrapped up. So. Do we have German? We do have German viewers. I, I looked this up on our analytics, and apparently we have like a big percentage in Germany. Oh. So I just, I just Kalen told me that, and I was like, oh, cool. Yeah. So, hey, Germany, we forgive you. Uh, <laughs> thanks for listening. Do you know the, uh, oh, man, what's his name? I can't remember the comedian, comedian's name, but his bit about Germany where he's like, I, don't just, I just don't trust Germans. <laughs> Nor McDonald's. Not, not, yeah, yeah, not just McDonald's. one, yeah. but two world wars? <laughs> two, and they almost won. <laughs> it was this close. Nor McDonald. R.I.P. Next week we're doing Glorious Bastards. That's for you, oh, Germany. Yes. <laughs> That's their proudest part of their history. They love embracing Actually, it. we have they to talk end, about it all the time. We have <laughs> to end the podcast talking about Star Wars. This is just what we do. Um, oh, have yeah. you guys seen The Acolyte? Nope. No. <clears throat> it's hot garbage it's woke bullshit isn't it <laughs> it's woke fucking woke. right it's woke fucking bullshit there's a black girl in that yeah she's a man not only once but twice she's in there twice somebody, she, somebody made a post about like God how like, damn it. All, the, all the black male characters have like the same hairstyle yeah they where got it's like the, it's like the it's like cut on the side and so it kind of like hang like and it's, a, it's a mohawk it's made swoop. out of dreads it's like yeah to the side Mm-hmm. Like it's in every. It's in every. It's in video games. Miles Morales and Spider Man yeah. Two has it. And no, I don't think I've ever seen anybody with that haircut before in real life. I think no. Odell yeah. Beckham had it for like a year. Who? Yeah, Odell, Odell Beckham. Beckham. Odell Beckham. Beckham. Oh yeah, you're right. I think he it was a big that. haircut like six years ago. Yeah. But all the all the people are just repeating it because it's the only thing they know how to. They don't know how to do black hair usually, or they <laughs> they just put a mop on their head basically. <laughs> 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 If anything, Star Wars is the place for ugly hair that doesn't make any sense, and you need to make it weird, right? Because, like, they made the thing having a rat tail. Canon. They so, got like, to bring back, so like, the, the 70s-style haircuts. The mullets and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, and they need to bring back white actors. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but we love Sam Jackson. <laughs> he was great. <laughs> Sam Jackson was bald. He didn't have yeah, a little he, swoop. Exactly. He didn't you ever have seen him in Django. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's his best role. Yeah. <laughs> they gonna work you all day, every day <laughs> until your back give out. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he was like. Django was hanging yeah. upside down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they they gonna cut your balls it's like your, off. It's like your first day, and you're talking to like the twelve year employee there. They gonna <laughs> Walton work you. Walton Goggins like dra- yeah, That's like why I said all the new the, hires yeah, at my new job. Like, we gonna work you. <laughs> Walton Goggins like grabbed Django's balls for a long time in that scene. He was like holding on to Jamie Foxx's nutsack it's about for like to be a while. Was it Walton actually Goblin. Jamie Foxx's? I, I don't know. Maybe it was like a prosthetic ball sack. But it, it was like a stuntman's ball sack. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. I've heard most junk is like a is a wearable. Yeah. Prosthetic. It's a prosthetic. Yeah. That would be That's why they're all like nine inches long. <laughs> when they when they film sex scenes, they put like a patch. Over their uh, their genitals, and they're kind of just like dry humping. Okay, like stuff. cap. Can, really? Can you, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, you get a sleeve <laughs> for your for your your, your wang. You be like sweating so much. Oh, there. I know. Fuck around, get a. Bummer. I know it smell crazy in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> Guys, we we're trying to talk about Star Wars. We ended up talking about uh, genitalia. So. Much you, in you brought up Walt this Goggins story. holding Jamie Foxx's balls upside down. <laughs> All that to say, don't watch The Acolyte. It's a piece of shit. There's is no. there anything redeeming about it? Like, is there anything good? I think no. the... Uh, so they, they kind of did this thing where it's like the Jedi take children. And that's like an, oh. an interesting concept where it's like they, yeah. they come to these planets and they basically kidnap children. And like that's like... Could be interesting if you flesh that out a little bit, but they didn't want to do that. There's a couple good ideas, but it's very badly written and just like like there's no character depth to like anyone, and it's just like forward momentum on the plot. You should care because it's Star Wars, you know. It's the things you know. They also like do this thing. It's all your they friends. Just like, <laughs> yeah. They break the physics of Star Wars. Not that Star Wars really had physics to begin with, but it's like so anybody can get stabbed with a fucking lightsaber and be okay now. Where it's like before, it was like Qui-Gon got hit in the chest, and he fucking died. You know, lightsabers, they slice, and they they, they dice, and they cut. Okay, but we started this. No Country for Old Men is a good movie. With uh, somehow Palpatine returned. (laughs) What did you say? (laughs) 
<laughs> Talk about No Country Old Man. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. That's a good one. No, but like, uh, watch Star but the, Wars. Watch so that. the the lady, the big like promotional aspect was the lady from the Matrix was a Jedi, and she gets killed in the first like two minutes by a knife in the left tit. Baited. So I'm like. I don't understand the physics. Like you can get sliced with a lightsaber and be fine, but if you get like a little dagger that's like two inches, was it like, like an actual blade? It was like a little like throwing knife, like a little dagger. And she got hit like in the in, her, in the boob. And there she, should not be throwing died. knives in Star Wars. No, it should be tiny stupid. tiny lightsabers. <laughs> <laughs> little Pez dispenser. You want to do something cool? Yeah. Okay. If you want to do something cool with Star Wars, L- lazy, put laser more throwing knife. Yeah, yeah, get let's get white people. Back. <laughs> yeah, let's get white people back on the TV. They're such a <laughs> disenfranchised people. Yeah. They need more representation. It is funny in this show because literally all the white people are like painted green or like <laughs> 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 they're like hiding all the white people. Uh, it feels like it was cl- the one thing. It does feel like it was clinically made to enrage like that subset of nerds. You, you just sent me clickbait. something the other day where the main actress she did a diss track. She did a rap a diss track. Diss track to, against basically uh, at Star Wars fans or the Star Wars that, backlash people. She was like, "You a bunch of bigots." <laughs> <laughs> Dang. It was kind of a, a bop. Not gonna lie. Very funny to take like <laughs> beloved IP and just run it purely out of spite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like it exists now just to spite its fans. I think base. that means they get Star Wars, because part about being a Star Wars fan is hating Star Wars. <laughs> That's true, yeah. yeah. It's a big part. Okay. Can we end the podcast now? Sure. Well, let's. We should do this again. You're welcome back anytime, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Uh, have, a, have a lovely day. Uh, you know, sleep tight. Tuck yourself in. Wrap yourself in the blankets. Give yourself a handy. And then just put... <laughs> drink, just water. drink water. Drink <laughs> water. <laughs> and then put Perfect Movie Podcast on your phone quietly while it sits on the charger. Don't wank Run up them streams. Us, please. <laughs> I'll listen to you guys in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> Scrub-a-dub-dub. <laughs> I always say this is what it come to. Three years ago, I previsioned it. It ain't even three years we've been married. Three years ago, I said them very words, no and good. Here we are, 90 degree heat. I got the cancer. And look at this, not even my home to go to. We're going to El Paso, Texas. You know how many people I know in El Paso, Texas? No, ma'am. That's how many. <laughs>